<laughs> and so, so, we, and when I heard stories like this, we actually ended up developing another questionnaire asking them to rate on a scale from like an everyday experience to the most significant experience of their life, what this experience was. And we've had people now complete those questionnaires at um, either one or two months after experiences, and then 14 months later, over a year later. And the remarkable feature of that is that uh, is that most people are saying it's at least in the top five most meaningful and spiritually significant experiences of their lives. In our first study, uh, about 30% of these already spiritually inclined people said it was the single most meaningful spiritually experience or single most spiritually significant experience of their life. So clearly, clearly this experience has authority and meaning to them that is unlike anything I've seen. So I've been doing, you know, this psychopharmacology research in, in humans for, um, you know, almost 40 years now at Hawkins. I've worked with a whole variety of different kinds of classes of drugs. I'm accustomed to talking to people about drug effects and, uh, and their thoughts about drug effects. And never have I seen something that, it, what makes this so unusual, it's informing, uh, informing the individual going forward in time. So you ask someone after they've been drunk, what, you know, what was that experience like? And, and it's in memory. Well, I got drunk and we, you know, played games or whatever. And if it informs them going forward, it's only maybe, you know, I'm never going to drink, uh, you know, shots of tequila again. Right. You know? it, it's not as um, fundamentally transformative. It was a, oh, you know, it was great at the time, but now that I look back, eh, not so much. And uh, what's striking me as several things about what you're saying is that you you yourself in meditation were finding that the experiences that you had just in meditation were were fundamentally different and seemingly in contrast with your other work, which is very scientific and grounded in in hard facts and evidence. And suddenly there was an experiential event which lent a an energy and a a passion and an interest and one of the things that we as science minded people and skeptics are are often misinterpreted as being is that uh, you know we we suck all the interest and the wonder and the the uh, joy out of things and it's not that at all these are not incompatible at all in the least and in particular, you approaching the the work with Silas Sibin as uh, from a more skeptical viewpoint, not not believing necessarily that this would have a, quite an impact, and having, as you just said, many many years of experience with these substances and how they affected people and how they they would report it. This was uh, something that has carried meaning forward, and that is something I have heard in speaking with others about. Uh, this substance and and others is that they can really help expand one's awareness of the possibilities of one's interconnectedness and and this is it's important to note that this is a perception that we have this is in a mind state and that's okay that it has a positive transforming effect in one's life to happiness to joy towards looking out for the other as much as we look out for ourselves and again, as you're saying, many months later, there's still a reference to that as, yes, this was one of the most important things that has happened to me, that we term the mystical experiences. And as, as you and I were chatting earlier, we sometimes get gummed up a little bit on our terminology, but that doesn't mean necessarily, we, we tend to take it, but it doesn't always mean supernatural. That's not what we're talking about. This is induced by a biological reaction to a substance that is introduced into the body, this is perfectly natural. But there's still an experience out of it that one takes and is transformative in their lives. So based on some of that, uh, what are some of the therapeutic directions that this can take people? Where What are you looking at 
for this. Well, well, let me let me just back up to um, uh, the the mystical experience, the, and and the so the fact is that this experience was, you know, was occasioned under these very uh, very predetermined sets of conditions where people had uh, uh, they had preparation, they've been highly selected, they were. Uh, I, I did mention the context in which it was given. It was given to people who. Uh, who came in for the a session day? They reclined on a couch. They had eye shades on and headphones through which they listened to classical music. They were instructed to uh, direct their attention inward on their inner experience, and they were in the presence of two monitors with whom they had a, a trusting relationship. So they felt they could surrender to the uh, to the experience. Um, but the the core features of that experience map on one for one with this so-called spontaneously occurring mystical experience. And so the scientifically, the exciting piece of that is that, um, that these mystical experiences have been described, uh, you know, for millennia, uh, by people who have come upon them and had their and, and interpret them, you know, however. Uh, but they haven't been amenable to prospective scientific study. All we can do is, up until this point, is interview those people who had these experiences and, uh, and, and, and learn about the nature of those experiences. But we, we really can't study uh, the conditions that occasion those experiences or what their consequences are. With psilocybin as a model system now, we can prospectively study the uh, the nature of uh, these experiences. And so that, to me, as a, as a scientist, I mean, like a kid in a candy shop, there are a million ways to go with this. Uh, so, so we can now do reductive neuroscience kinds of studies to look at where where in brain, what areas are activated under these kinds of conditions. Uh, we can look at um, pharmacological interaction, what kind of antagonists uh, and, and what other neurophysiological systems uh, are activated during these experiences. Um, we can also ask questions about from the realm of biological psychiatry, what personality variables, what set and setting conditions are important to producing these kinds of experiences? Are there genetic predispositions that increase the likelihood of these experiences? But uh, even if those are active, most people have these experiences under these kinds of uh, set and setting conditions. And then, you know, and then the whole question about um, uh, how do these experiences occur to experiences that arise, say, from meditation, so a phenomenological um, comparisons, and then what's the consequences of these experiences? How do they play out in in someone's life, uh, you know, over time? And so those are all, you know, valid sets of questions that can be asked, and one of the horrendously frustrating so being a scientist interested in this is NIH is still uh, uh, reacting to the demonization of these compounds from the 1960s and has not funded a single clinical trial these kinds of compounds yet and I'm I'm absolutely convinced that's going to change this is it's just it's far too interesting and important uh, to not fund this research at some point. And, uh, and you asked about, uh, future directions. There are a number of different directions that, that, uh, uh, that we're going. So we've done systematic replications and dose effect comparisons with psilocybin in healthy, uh, in healthy volunteers. And then, um, and then recently we've undertaken a very interesting study that would be of interest, uh, to your uh, listener, listening audience, I'm sure that we're looking at this intersection between psilocybin and meditation. And, um, 
And here we're taking in for the study that we're currently enrolling, which is op only open to people local in the Baltimore community and Washington community. Um, uh, we're taking in people who are interested in initiating a meditation practice but don't have an established practice and, uh, and who are curious about the effects of psilocybin. And we're looking for the uh, uh, synergy, the potential synergy between the two. And my thought about that is um, that, uh, uh, that meditation and psilocybin are, uh, are similar to the extent that they're, they're both ways of exploring the nature of consciousness or the nature of mind, if you will. And I, and I sometimes think of meditation as the uh, slow shore, long course in the nature of mind. And, um, and, and that's what we learn in meditation is, uh, is how our minds work and, and, uh, and, uh, and I think of, um, I think of psilocybin in some respects as a crash course in the nature of mind. <laughs> that, uh, that some of the truths that, uh, emerge from, uh, uh, from, meditative experiences are also the same truths that uh, emerge um, from psilocybin. So under the effects of, uh, of the drug, people recognize that, um, you know, they, they are, they're not their minds, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that there is a sense of uh, interconnectedness of, uh, of all things. Uh, and that, and that, uh, there's very substantial information that can be forthcoming uh, if if one looks deeply into the nature of mind and the phenomena that arise. And um, and so uh, so in that study, we're we're looking at how psilocybin might facilitate uh, engagement with meditation practices, and then a whole variety of. Um, other kinds of dispositional tendencies uh, toward forgiveness and gratitude and pro-social kinds of behavior. Um, another study that uh, we're that's in the planning stage is that would be of interest to your uh, your listener uh, audience uh, is that that with in collaboration with uh, Richie Davidson. We are planning a study of the effects of psilocybin in long-term established meditators. And, uh, and we, uh, we're still writing the protocol and haven't, uh, finally uh, decided on what the parameters of, uh, definition of a long-term meditator is going to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right now we're thinking, uh, that, you know, the longer the better and the more established the better. So, years if not decades of daily meditation practice and substantial retreat practice and there we're interested in uh, determining uh, uh, what the nature of these experiences are from the perspective of so someone who is highly trained in terms of self-observation and whether that importantly informs their meditation practice uh, going forward, and with Richie Davidson, we'll do a number of uh, neuroimaging measures with fMRI to uh, to assess uh, some of the variables that uh, he's shown uh, differentiate long-term Tibetan meditators from novice meditators. So it's a uh, uh, so it, and 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 in the study, we'll also look at the effects of low-dose uh, psilocybin on Different forms of meditation, like uh, like shamatha uh, versus open awareness practice in in loving kindness. So there, there's <laughs> there's a lot lot to be done there, and it's very exciting.